Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thank you for coming and welcome to this talk about um, origins, uh, the from origins of the family, private property and state um, by Engels, which is a really important text where he traces for the first time the development of the family from a class-based position, um, examining the shift that society has gone through from prehistoric hunter-gatherer tribes to the modern nuclear family as we know it today, um, and its oppressive grasp of the individual, in particular women, that we'll examine throughout the discussion. Um, and his text is really seminal because it's tracing the family from a materialist perspective. And this is what sets his um, theory apart from the others. And the theory that Engels outlines, uh, to quote from him, is the determining factor in history is, in the last resort, the production and reproduction of immediate life. On the one hand, the production of the means of subsistence, of food, clothing, shelter. On the other hand, the production of human beings themselves, the propagation of the species. So the social institutions under which we live are conditioned by both of these types of production, the stage of development of labour and, on the other hand, of the family. In other words, how people live um, is, is determined by the development of the productive forces and the shape and organisation that the family is taking as analogous to that. Um, and in this way, the family becomes a tool um, for the reproduction and the continuation of capitalism and class-based society um, in the same way that commodities are equally important to capitalism, so too is the reintroduction of new human beings. Um, and this makes perfect sense because if you do not recreate a new layer of working class to go into your factories and produce, then capitalism can no longer continue to function. Um, so it, you know, the family and the, instigate, the propagation of the species is just as important as the continuation of the um, making of commodities. Um, but really importantly, the family has not always just been a tool for the continuation of class society and capitalism. As Henry Lewis Morgan outlined in his text, Ancient Society, which is what Engels bases a lot of his ideas on, and from Marx as well, the, pam the family has passed through um, several stages linked to the changes in human development as they arise. And Morgan called these stages um, savagery, barbarism and civilization. and we'll sort of trace the family as it moves through these stages. But really importantly, through examining these stages um, and this corresponding evolution of the family alongside those, Morgan opened up this idea that the so-called eternal patriarchal, patriarchal family that we kind of assume has existed forever has not existed forever. Um, meaning that these traditional family roles that are still very, very present in our society today, um, where men are the heads of household and they're traditionally married to a woman who takes care of the household, this hasn't existed for all of time. And Morgan and Engels prove that on a scientific basis. In fact, there's a wealth of evidence that shows that previous societies, hunter-gatherer communities, were egalitarian. They were not based on the oppression um, or subjugation of one sex over the other. Um, and if that's correct, as Engels very clearly demonstrates in his texts, then women are not naturally subordinated to men. Um, they were subordinated, um, and they were done, that happened to them through the development of property um, in relation to the development of private property in particular, and that's what we're going to trace and outline today. So an important question then is why did that happen? If societies and families have not always oppressed women, why is it that today that is the case that we see? Um, and the answer is that as economic production changed, so too did the shape and role of the family. Um, but this point is still challenged today, and it's not just challenged by conservatives or reactionaries, it's challenged by feminist theorists. Um, and with these ideas being raised and, and challenging this idea that the family has been, you know, not always been static, it's essential and really important today that we're having this discussion to defend Engels' ideas um, and see what is necessary to go about changing the family for the future and what our role could possibly be in changing the family as it is right now. So before there was class and uh, therefore exploita uh, exploitation of one class over another, humans lived in primitive communistic societies and they were based on a food gathering economy. Work that needed to be done was shared equally amongst the members of the family or the group or the gens as they're called um, and different types of labour, for example, domestic labour in the home, gathering food outside of the home and hunting were seen on an equal basis. No one of those was seen as more important than another type of labour. Um, and at this stage that, that Morgan and Engels are talking about, um, he calls it savagery, but we might be more familiar with the Paleolithic era to describe this point in time. Um, and evidence of these societies, even though they're incredibly ancient, still exists today. And by looking at those, we can understand the shape and the changes that the family's gone through. For example, there are still some communities of Aborigines, um, the world's oldest continuous culture, where equality exists between individuals regardless of sex. 
Um, and in 2015, the journal Science conducted a study um, examining contem other contemporary hunter-gatherer tribes in um, the Aborigine tribes, as so some of them, but also in the Philippines and the Congo, and found those tribes to still be egalitarian. And in this article from Science, um, the author Peter Gray commented, wherever they are found in Africa, Asia, South America or elsewhere, in deserts or in jungles, these societies have many characteristics in common. In each of these societies, the dominant cultural ethos was one that emphasised individual autonomy, um, non-directive child rearing methods, non-violence, sharing, cooperation and consensual <coughs> decision making. Their core value, which underlay all of the rest, was that of equality of individuals. And if we can see evidence of that existing in these communities today, that also was the way in which previous prehistoric hunter-gatherers organised their communities too. And at this point in history, the monogamous family has absolutely no existence. It's nowhere near um, the way that the families and the gens organised themselves. Um, and in fact, children were traced matrilinearly matrilinear down the mother line. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, they were seen as just as essential in their communities as men were. Um, and the reason that they traced the children down this line was because groups, um, groups or tribes or gens tended to be kind of, I'm using the word married, but of course it didn't have the same kind of connotations then, but sort of joined together. Um, and so it was very difficult to know who the father of a child was when people were taking multiple partners between these groups. And so this was the logical, natural way to trace um, inheritance. Um, and as I said, equality existed between the sexes in these, um, this type of family. So why was it the case then and not now? Well, Engels states that the original position of mothers as the sole absolutely certain parent of their children secured for them and all other women a higher social level than they have ever enjoyed since. The positioning of women as more central in the family comes as a consequence of this matrilineal tracing um, and, and of course as well as of collective property. Um, so individual private possessions existed at this point, of course they did, um, but generally property was not something that was kind of considered, land wasn't owned, um, and, and, and you know, ho houses and home and things like that were shared collectively, the cooking materials, the tools and things. Um, and so everything was collectively owned in as far as it could be because everything was collectively produced. People didn't work singularly on their own, that was impossible. Um, and as well as that, there was no sort of sense of owning the land. It wasn't like you had a plot or anything like that, especially because of the kind of movement of these tribes, um, but also the, perspe the sort of perspective that they were of the land. They didn't own it. It wasn't something that they could control. Um, so in these small scale king groups, all collected um, and all hunted food to be shared amongst the entire group. So that led to social relations being based on that equality as well. Um, and the collective method of production of the necessities of life is the thing that allowed for those collective social relationships, that equality. People were completely interdependent on each other, therefore they were all of equal value to one another. No one could survive outside of those um, groups. They were, you know, it was impossible to live as a singular individual. Um, and so these small scale king groups were really important and so was the equality and respect that people had between them. Um, so as I said, collective property as, it, as much as it existed was passed down the female line um, to those known to be her children or back to sisters rather than, um, you know, if a woman's husband died, for example, things wouldn't go to the, to the man left alive. Um, the inheritors were therefore the family rather than an individual person. And so it was a group inheriting any products or wealth or anything that was left rather than one individual person. Um, and so the wealth stayed within the family by doing that rather than it being passed to an individual <laughs> man, especially because um, then if it was sort of, with, if you imagine the matrilineal tracing of descent, um, if inheritance or if any property left was to go to the man, it would be going outside of the family, the, the female centered family. Um, and so in these societies, which we could call a matriarchy, um, we'll discuss more on that in just a second, um, mothers are the center of culture without ruling over any other members of society. Um, and women-led societies, so um, when we talk about them as, as, I'm sort of saying, as a matriarchy to define that, it's not the opposite of a patriarchy, um, because a patriarchy is dependent upon private property, of which the woman becomes a part um, and through which they're oppressed and exploited. 
So in capitalism, the work in the home, still done predominantly by women, is seen as valueless. But here in these communal households, the exact opposite is true. There would be no life at all without the women. They were essential, they gave birth to life, and therefore they were revered. Um, the fact that they worked and were in control of the household as well, which was the role that women played, um, this was seen as e equally valued to that of what men were doing outside of the home, meaning they weren't seen as weak or useless either, which is a characteristic that became associated with the bourgeois women who did not work later in society. We'll come on to that later. Um, so they were respected for the work that they did um, and the contribution to every late, everyday life. And just to give an example, um, this was true um, of the Iroquois of North America, the tribes that um, Morgan sort of lived with and was adopted by in, in the study of his work, Ancient Society. Um, and in their society, children were brought up collectively by members of the same gen or kin group, um, and men lived in their maternal homes, still helping with child rearing and playing a father fold sort of figure to those um, children, but not their own biological children who were unknown. Um, and we can see further evidence of this sort of matrilineal organisation um, when we look to a different country as well. We can look to Germany for this. And Tacitus, who's writing around 100 AD, examined the German um, gens, which are called Cooney, um, and he observed the family relations and noted that where there was to be some kind of bond put on somebody to continue or carry out a promise, it wasn't the son of the person that was chosen, it was their nephew, because then the man would be much more likely to continue and hold out his promise when that promise was to an entire family unit rather than to a single individual who was often not even known to them. Um, so we can very clearly see from these examples that the family has not always existed in the way that we see it today. Um, and there's a wealth of evidence to prove that. However, as I said, there's opposition to this. There's opposition to the idea that the family has changed and that it was once equal and that women were once in this revered position. Um, academics and individuals argue against this. I come across it quite often in discussions of this where people say, well, <laughs> okay, it might, it might have been slightly different, but men are so much stronger. It's through their strength um, that they've come to be in this position of power over women. Um, I was having a discussion with, uh, with just a group of women in Sheffield just a couple of weeks ago where she, you know, one woman was saying, well, they're just, you know, they could just slap you down. They're stronger. You can't have equality for this exact reason. Um, and these people argue that because of this, equality can never have existed um, on the basis that um, gendered labour has always been hierarchical um, due to strength and this is the kind of determining factor in the shape of the family and this argument rests upon the idea that men are, have this in some, some cases sort of genetic propensity to strength that women do not have meaning that they were the fighters in their families um, they controlled weaponry and therefore this is the reason that led to male dominance um, and people from that take the leap that that also gave men political dominance um, and that matriarchies couldn't have existed because where you had strength leading to political control, how could women have a say in those societies or in those families? Um, but the only conclusion that can be drawn from this for the future, if we take that to be true, is that women will always be oppressed because we're not going to suddenly change the genetical makeup of human beings. Um, and therefore, there's no chance of equality. If that's human nature, how can we change the very thing that is the human? Now, thankfully, these critics are wrong, um, and Morgan and Engels proved them to be. So whilst historically labour was divided to an extent, it certainly didn't resemble division leading to power and control in the way that I've just described. Women played an equal role politically, um, socially and culturally, which I'll just use a few points to evidence. So firstly, there's a lot of evidence to show um, that the gender division of labour in a, in a kind of hierarchical way didn't exist. Um, I've already talked about the essential role that women played in the family homes. Um, and, you know, there were there was division in, in, in labour among sort of from a, set, a viewpoint of the sex. Um, women who had to have children often stayed closer to their homes because it was necessary in order to nurse the babies. And that led to them taking on a sort of more gathering role, um, carrying babies on their backs when they were old enough. Whereas men didn't need to stay at home to physically nurse a child <coughs> and obviously therefore were, were more able to hunt. Um, However, hunting wasn't a reliable source of food. It wasn't a successful trip every single time. And so actually, the gathering of the food from close round to the home was often an essential source of, of food and nutrients. Um, and so both of these tasks were essential and, and equal to the continuing 
feeding of the of the family essentially and it's the women's labor there that, that was one of the most important roles the collecting and the gathering um and so um secondly we see that men didn't have complete control over weaponry anyway so already there's a quality in the roles that existed um leading to no greater hierarchy for men or for women but also um a recent study that was carried out by the university of florida of ethiopian tribes concluded that stone tool production had not only been carried out by men but had been shared equally by men and by women. So there was no monopoly over weaponry by men at all in the first place either. Um, and finally, even if men were the only ones with this control of weaponry, what reason would they have to suddenly start subordinating and attacking and uh, you know, changing their attitude towards the women that they were living with, especially when we've already established how revered the women in these communities were, the bringers of life, uh, the contributors in the same way that anybody else was. Reasons and means to oppress uh, people um, are, are both really important to look at. So they may have had the means, the tools and the strength to oppress, but without a motive, this didn't happen. Um, and so these come from the material conditions, the motive uh, that comes along later. And as long as work of women was seen as essential and recognised as such, why would men <coughs> with spears attack them, as I've said? Um, armed men do not live outside of the relation of these hunter and gatherer groups. They're not separate, they're not... Uh, subject to different rules and laws they can't control their own actions and still be part of a group um, in fact there's evidence to demonstrate that men who did use their strength and their weaponry against the family were outcast from that community um, and um, Engels demonstrates this again through his treatment of the Iroquois that individuals you know can possess arms but you still fall within the control of the group um, and actually the Iroquois council showed this because the the leaders of the councils were elected by men and by women um, and if they did something that was well the, basically they had direct accountability if they did something that the family did not like or that was against their ideas and their aims then they could be removed and it was this council that had the kind of power to uh, agree to war or agree to battles happening um, and so they had complete control over over war and strength and the desire to do so um, so clearly we can see that it's not strength that led to the subordination of women um, what have I pressed there we go um, there was a time before um, men ex exerted their strength as a tool of control and therefore there will be again in fact, there are living examples of such societies that are existing right now. Um, such a matriarchy can be found in the um, Minangkabau in West Sumatra, Indonesia, and they're the largest known matriarchy at 4 million people. Um, and in this living example, women usually do sort of continue in the domestic sphere, um, while men take on political and spiritual leadership roles. However, both feel, uh, both sexes feel that um, separation of power keeps them on an equal footing. Just to give a bit more on that, upon marriage, women acquire their own sleeping quarters and the husband may sleep in the same place, but at morning returns home to the, to the kind of like mother family home to have breakfast. Um, and at age 10, boys leave their mother's home to stay in the men's quarter and they learn practical skills and religious teachings so that separation of, of labor but not in a hierarchical way um, and while the clan chief is always male women select that chief um, and they can remove him from, from office if he doesn't do what they would like them to do very similar to the Iroquois um, so we see another example of where there are divided roles but non, neither of those roles are seen as more important and therefore giving more weight to that individual um, so we, even, we see even more examples of how women's role in the home did not diminish their standing in society with these living examples. And there are many, many more. I just don't have time to go into all of those. Um, but we also see um, the significance of women in, in ancient societies through examining cave art as well. So um, scientists have shown that the majority of cave art has, was, uh, especially with like hands, was conducted by women. And they've measured the shape of the bones of um, like the, the skeletons that they've found compared to the release of the art on the wall. And they've seen that this was conducted by women. Now, this is really significant because not only do people often suggest that it was men that carried out these spiritual religious roles and with this art disproving that, but this cave art's especially significant. It was very difficult to get to. Um, they were not easy to make and it took time away from the natural things in the home that were, were more required. You know, the urgency of needing food to eat is a priority over the production of arts, no matter how nice it might be or how important and significant it might be 
might be. And so women conducting this type of work and, and you know, being able to take part in the production of art had their time freed up to do this. Um, it, was, it was really special in these communities, almost seen as a kind of magic, um, and showed the position of women as entrusted um, with power and with responsibility, again, defeating this idea uh, that, that men, through their strength, gain political or cultural or social dominance. This is not the case. So the family very clearly has not existed as it does today for all of eternity. Um, before it, factually, egalitarian communities did exist. So why did this change? Um, well, Engels notes that the human labour power at this stage does not yet produce a considerable amount over and above the cost of subsistence. But when king groups were able to achieve more than this, a change in the family arose. We come now to the Neolithic Revolution. Um, Family relations changed when the material conditions um, of production changed again at this point. Um, so changes in the material conditions tend to come first and family changes afterwards in response to the material world changing. So this shift from primitive communistic households occurred as a consequence of the Neolithic revolution or the agrarian revolution, um, moving from hunter-gatherer production to the cultivation of crops and the domestication of animals um, for eating, essentially. Um, as well as the development of tools, which led to a greater production and wealth amassing in the gens or the family homes. Um, and so this shift, uh, this led to a shift in the economic relations. People were able for the first time to produce a surplus of food. Um, and this led to a population increase on the one hand, but also the ability to trade. Um, again, generating more wealth, especially from areas, the more fertile areas where the gens were settling. So as the natural division of labour had led the men to doing work outside of the home, um, they naturally had ownership of, of the tools used to do that, whilst women would have had ownership of the things needed to cook and produce in the family home. It was just a natural, ordinary, logical thing to have happened. You need to use these things, you need to use these things, uh, rather than an active decision. So. Um, where the women kind of collected and carried on passing down these tools in the kitchen, that's what men were using these tools outside for hunting and gathering, collecting these, collecting and amassing wealth as they were the ones hunting and producing and then farming and then killing the animals that they were farming. Um, and at this stage, don't forget that the family structure is slow to change. So men's children were not inheriting the property that he was kind of continually amassing. In the same way, um, so if a man died, basically his um, belongings or the property or the tools, the wealth that he had amassed, wouldn't be passed to his children. They would, or, nor would they be passed to his wife and the female family gens from the matrilineal side. They go back to the gens from which he had come from. Um, so with restrictions around marriage um, emerging uh, that promoted greater genetic diversity, not knowingly but through experience, of course, the family started to have to split more regularly. Okay, so you could no longer all live in the same family home. Um, and this centered around a brother or a sister moving out and establishing new gens. Um, this was also combined with the introduction of people, traders coming in who were not traditionally from the gens. And so what you have is a shift in the family from living completely together in the, the gens family home to much more independent family units living outside of that. Um, and that's significant because there was a moving away from this sort of old genteel organisation as this property begins to develop um, and as the population begins to, um, to grow. Um, and the men were amassing more wealth through their work with their tools and so grew the desire to pass on this wealth to their own children. Um, and I'm very keen on this point that it's not just an idea that popped into people's minds suddenly one day like, oh, I don't want to pass it back to my family anymore. It was because of these changes in the material conditions that I've outlined where if you as a, as a smallish family unit are no longer living in the traditional family home, the gens, passing your, like, that wealth back to them when somebody died became quite an unnatural and alien thing to do. You were no longer living with that family. And so this desire comes about through the changes in the spatial organisation of the family. Um, and it's at this point that we see the shift from matrilineal to patrilineal descent, um, favouring accumulation of wealth by the family unit, by these sort of increasingly individual units, uh, rather than the gens, which gave that family unit more power rather than the clan or the gens that we've described before. And it's through this development of property um, that um, Gentile organisation reaches its limit. Um, and this leads to the abolishing completely of matrilineal descent and tracing. Um, thus, we begin to see the monogamous relationship developing, not through 
mutual love suddenly occurring, um, but through the need to emphatically know who your children are in order to pa pass on your collected wealth that you have amassed throughout your lifetime. Um, and so this ushers in chastity for women, uh, subjugation and control over them and their day-to-day -day lives and who they can partner with. Um, and they essentially become commodities themselves, reduced from equals in society to just vessels for inheritance. Um, and Engels explains this. He says, monogamy was, not the uh, sorry, monogamy was the first form of the family, not founded on natural, but on economic conditions. Therefore, it is the victory of private property over primitive and natural <coughs> collectivism. And he describes this as, as essentially the first class division. And as with other class division, um, it developed the welfare and advancement of one class, the, the male sex, over the other, the female sex. Um, and, and this is really where we see women becoming a, a commodity or property themselves through this point. And clearly we can see that this is a consequence of the material conditions changing through the development of tools and labour, um, and the family changes as a response to that in order to fit the new mode of production. So with the advent of class society, matriarchy um, becomes impossible, showing that the dominance of one gender over another is linked to the dominance of a class, one class over another, the emerging uh, ruling class. So the downfall of maternal law was the historic defeat of the, human, uh, the female sex, turning them into these machines for the generation of children that I've talked about, and diminishing the role that they played socially um, in, the produ in production in the home. Um, and we see an example of these relations where women are literally just properly property in ancient Assyria, where the punishment for the rape of a woman was the handing over of the rapist's wife to the husband um, of his victim to basically further rape. Um, but the point is why this happened. Why did this happen? Um, because the rape of someone's wife was seen as like a damaging of that man's property and therefore reparations were paid to the man. Absolutely no regard for the women involved in this situation. Um, and so, you know, I think this is, whilst harsh, a very clear example of how women were really treated as just a commodity that could be damaged and traded and, and repaid for. Um, so a further example of the development of monogamy can be seen in the Greeks, who previously had held women in, in higher esteem, as evidenced by their goddesses um, in, in mythology, but later degraded the role of women. For example, heroes in the Greek tales, such as the Iliad, had women brought to them in their tents, in the role of prizes, um, and the women were the mothers of the legal heirs to the heroes um, and, and the men, and they took the role of essentially head housekeeper. Um, and they were expected to be chased whilst the men had absolutely no obligation to also be chased as well. So monogamy from its inception really is for women only. Um, it's not for men. And this is a characteristic that has stayed the same throughout our concept of the family and you can see the sort of vestiges of that in the attitudes that I think still exist in society today towards women who take multiple partners compared to men that's a kind of overhang of these relationships um, and so with the rise of labor that produced property came the relegation of women's labor too it's not just the uh, treatment of women as properties but the type of work that they're doing becomes degraded and belittled um, so Engels says in the old communistic household, which comprised many couples and their children, the administration of the household entrusted to women was just as much a public function, a socially necessary industry, as the procuring of food by the men. With the patriarchal family, and still more with the single monogamous family, a change came. Household management lost its public character. It no longer concerned society, it became a private service. The wife became the head servant, as exemplified in the Greek situation I just explained, um, excluded from all participation in social production. So through the removal of domestic labour's importance and equality with other labour came the reduction of, of the woman's role, that belittling of labour that I talked about. And why was it deemed less important? Um, well, because it didn't produce items that could be sold to turn a profit. Um, and whilst domestic labour is still socially necessary for the raising of children and the continuation of the species, it was no longer on an equal footing to the production that men were carrying out that produced goods, commodities, things that could be sold to turn a profit and further the wealth of the family unit. So this further reduced the position of women in society. Um, so by examining the rise of patriarchy in this way, um, as analogous to class society's origins, we can understand that a matriarchy is not the mirror image of patriarchy, as I started off by pointing it out. It didn't involve the subordination of men to women, um, as women are to men under patriarchy, but instead it was a natural way of organising inheritance and relations in the family through a tangibly traceable line, that of a mother being certain who her children were. 
Um, but in patriarchy, the tracing of children through the male line is not a natural method. It requires restrictions, promises, guarantees. So with the rise of class society, women are subordinated to men for the purpose of the continuation of amassing wealth. Um, and their labour loses its value as it does not produce commodities um, on the same breath. Um, so men, importantly, subjugated women for a material reason. And that material reason still exists today, property. We come now to the development of the bourgeois family. Um, and you know we've, we're starting to see here, obviously, the family we've established has changed, but it didn't just change once, it's changed multiple times throughout history. And so the instigation of monogamy is not the only change that has happened. The nuclear family, as we understand it today, has also developed over time. And through this, we understand <coughs> that it's not a natural institution. Um, so as material conditions changed again, and the mode of production with it to the capitalist mode of production, family relationships changed again. And this was linked to the development of the means of production and therefore the bourgeoisie as it developed, as capitalism developed. And Engels says at this stage for them that marriage according to bourgeois conception was a contract, a legal business affair. And again, we see familial relationships based around property. Um, in this case of increasing property, of protecting property within a given bloodline, um, and the woman remaining the position, in the position of the property of the man. Although arguably under capitalism, there begins to develop a kind of veil of choice arising. Um, and and this, this has existed right up until the modern day. In many countries, um, this is still happening, but even in the UK, marital rape was not made illegal until the 1980s, showing you an example of how women are this property that can, anything can be done to them. You are the ownership of the men. Many countries still have that as, a, as something that is allowed to happen as part of their law. Um, and um, this is, you know, it, it just sort of typifies that attitude that has come from these property relations. Um, and Marx explains, in the family, uh, sorry, in the bourgeois family, the bourgeois sees his wife as a mere instrument of production. And that is exactly what we see there by that kind of behaviour. Um, so in addition to being materially treated as property, these bourgeois women didn't work, as I said earlier. So they were unproductive and this further reduced their status and their inability to turn a profit. Um, so they remained in this position of subordination, of being worth less than a man, um, was considered in the emerging capitalist society. Um, but the establishment of the proletariat challenges that form of family. Just as Marx describes how capitalism contained within itself the seeds of its own destruction, it also contained within it the corresponding familial seeds of destruction in the proletariat family that undermines the nuclear family. Um, so with the establishment of, um, of capitalism and the proletariat, capitalism forces women into the workplace on top of the domestic labour that they already carry out. And the nuclear system um, is one, obviously, where you have like one man goes to work, one woman stays at home, raises the children, continues on with the species. This begins to disintegrate. Um, and in writing about the Industrial Revolution, Engels explains how women working undermined that bourgeois family. He talks about this in the conditions of the working class in England, where he examines the proletariat family um, and the position of men in, and women in the home and, and how they're sort of changing. So he says, in many cases, the family is not wholly dissolved by the employment of his wife, but turned upside down. <coughs> the wife supports the family, the husband sits at home, tends the children, sweeps the room and cooks. This case happens very frequently. In Manchester alone, many hundred such men could be cited, condemned to domestic occupations. And he further states, we must admit that so total a reversal of the positions of the sexes can have come to pass only because the sexes have been placed in a false position from the beginning. If the reign of the wife um, over the husband, as inevitably brought about by the factory system, is inhuman, the pristine rule of the husband over the wife must be inhuman too. And through examining the reversal of the roles of men and women, Engel shows that men and women in these strictly defined roles is not a natural way of organising the family at all. Therefore, we can see the introduction of the proletariat family as a progressive force um, in dissolving the bourgeois family. Um, and, and we see a lot more of the disillusionment of that today that I'll come on to now. Because the family under capitalism has brought both genders or both sexes, sorry, into, into the workforce, but left women typically with the, the domestic labour to do still on top of things. Um, UCL conducted a study this, this year, I think it was published in June, um, that showed that women do 16 hours of household chores on average a week where men do six in comparison. And of the families studied, 93% of the couples in that study said that women carried out the bulk of that housework. So things ha have, have changed in a very limited way. Um, so clearly 
you know, as we're seeing changes to the family, the bourgeois family structure, which was once seen as, as nat uh, this natural way, doesn't fit the proletariat. Um, and the very existence of the proletariat is challenging that notion and that idea of the family, um, proving again that the family hasn't always been like this. Um, but monogamy and the instigation of the nuclear family was caused by economic conditions, creating a family unit that was profitable to capitalism, where the family is still raised and educated and cared for without the need of a, a public character to that or public spending. Um, but that also means that the nuclear family cannot disappear until those um, economic conditions are changed. With a shift um, under socialism from individual to collective property, wage labour will disappear with it and the need for the nuclear family and this idea that workers need to be replicated because the working class will no longer exist. So the very existence of the proletariat challenges the bourgeois family and yet is not sufficient to overthrow it. We are still existing within the conditions um, of that nuclear family today. Um, and really importantly, although things have changed and although capitalism has modernised the family and has brought about some things that are more beneficial, on the whole, fundamentally, not a lot has changed at all. Um, we see a little bit more of the dissolution of the, of the family. Um, you know, families don't look a particular way anymore. They're not as strict, especially in some countries. So um, there are many single parent families, parents choosing to be parents on their own we see a lot of divorce in some cases women not men or women not choosing that um, there are same-sex couples and the shape of the family is, is changing again um, but this isn't because of some gradual process of liberal enlightenment that's brought about these changes it's the product of material conditions and the growth of the working class and the things that they have fought for um, and the bourgeois family basically is becoming obsolete though it still continues to exist We've got now legal equality in many ways, um, especially between the sexes in terms of pay, job role, voting rights, independence, healthcare, and yet patriarchy still continues to exist. Women are still oppressed. Um, and and it, it really asks that question that how can capitalism take us this far but not fully liberate women? Um, and the answer to that is that it's not in the interest of capitalism to provide the necessities of life that would free women from the domestic labor that they are still expected to carry out. Um, so, you know, how can you have the liberation of women in a society that, when it's going into crisis at any point, is stripping back the gains that may have been won by the working class previously? There's the question of how women are able to, therefore, engage politically in the changing of a society. Like, you know, it is much more difficult for women to attend political meetings um, because there's a need to stay at home or the need to take care of children or working hours and things like that. Um, and I think middle class feminists don't always see this. Um, it's part of a problem with that kind of perspective. Um, for them, raising women to the position of men is the answer um, to, to kind of like bring everybody up with them. But for working women, this changes absolutely nothing when the relationships are still defined by the economic conditions that continue to exist today. And this leads to situations, especially for working class women, where um, you can be economically trapped in a, in a potentially incredibly abusive relationship and there's no way for women to, to remove themselves from these things because of the material conditions of capitalism and, and the wage labour that it forces people to work under. Um, so the roles have been, these roles have been reinforced for centuries. Uh, they are deeply ingrained in people's consciousness. Um, and, and people are aware of this. You know, I'm preaching to the choir. Everybody knows the oppression that different groups in society face. Women know they are oppressed. But I hear people grumbling about it on the bus all the time, like, oh, I've got to do this ironing and things. And the people know about it. They don't need to be told this. Um, but at the same time, people sort of assume the family has always existed. Um, it's always had this form, it's always had this character, so just put up with it, that's just the way things are. Um, it is ancient, but it has an origin despite that, as we've established. So we've come up with a situation where we still have these overhangs of previous society and organisations, but because the material conditions have not shifted from a capitalist mode of production yet. So how do we change this? Well, changing the working class and working conditions of the working... Working conditions of the working too many working conditions change um, or are changed by the working class fighting for them. We're not handed things out um, simply by asking for them or wishing that they've changed. Um, we saw this you know, in the steps towards equality that have been taken. The right to vote was fought for by the Chartists and the suffragettes after them. Um, the the five-day week, the now laughable eight-hour day, you know, massive things that we're all well aware the working class fought for in order to gain. And the same is true of the equality between the sexes. This has all been fought for and hard won. Um, and we've ended up with legal equality. But legal equality 
doesn't really spell equality in any way that we're familiar with. It looks like a gender pay gap of around 20% still. It looks like women having the potential to climb higher in organisations, but not being able to do so because of um, stereotypes about them having children and the fear of bosses having to pay maternity pay and them not getting further. And in any case, having women at the top of businesses isn't going to help. Uh, it looks like women still shouldering the burden of domestic labour on top of working. And it looks like political meetings quite often dominated by men still as a consequence of this, not because women don't want to take part, but because they aren't able to. And this is what legal equality has gained for us. Um, we've shared, women have shared legal equality with men for a very long time, but as we know, that doesn't spell legal equality. So even though we've made some steps forward, we haven't progressed past these kind of older relationships that's still ongoing. And that's because changes in the family are slower to come about um, than the changes politically and economically. Um, Trotsky talks about this when he's describing the overturn and the changes in the family of the Soviet Union. He says, a deep going plough is needed um, to turn up heavy clods of earth, meaning that family relations are deep seated and they can't be overturned overnight. First, the material conditions have to be changed. Um, and when there's no longer wage labour and class society, there's no need to recreate the working class. There's no need to enslave women to do so. Um, and there's no need to cast the women as roles of sold or less domestic labourers in addition to their wage labouring. The destruction of private property will bring about the destruction of women as property. And the domestic labour will be shared equally, allowing women to participate fully in the political sphere. Therefore, we have to change the material conditions, eradicate the profit motive, eradicate private property, and re-establish the family based on mutual relationships. <coughs> In the linking of subjugation of women to the rise of private property, we can see a clear way to ending patriarchy as it exists today, where capitalism has failed and will always fail to do so. End private property, end the property relations that give rise to the social conditions that oppress women. This requires, though, the unity of the working class fighting as a joint endeavour. It's not the question of women. It's not the women's question singularly, alone, as something separate. It's a question of the family and equality for all that must be fight for, fought for by all sexes. The realm of possibility that socialism has to offer for what relationships could look like in the future is endless. Um, relationships based on choice being the main one, freedom to change partner freely. And Engels sort of talks about this as like the realisation of, of true monogamy, selecting a partner because of absolute choice, no, no other restrictions around that. Um, but Marxism is the only method that can achieve this. And, and why is it that Marxism is the only method to achieve this? Well, it's because feminism is not materialist in its outlook. It doesn't seek to understand how the family has changed, why the family has changed, or how and why it might change again in the future. Um, and, and that is something that is necessary to do in order to transform our society and to ensure, ensure we change the shape of the family moving forward. In scientifically understanding this, we can understand what is required to change because we have to change something. It's not going to naturally wither away as long as we are still living in a class society. Um, and so through this scientific method, um, we can see a clear path, a perspective for change and a method for changing that revolution. So as we've seen, the social relationships between individuals and families are dependent on the material conditions in which they live. The shape of the family, therefore, will change again when the material conditions change. Um, and we change the sort of socio-economic system from an exploitative capitalist one to a socialist one that puts humans, all humans, regardless of sex, gender, role, anything, on an equal footing. Only by establishing society in this way can we begin to erode the centuries of inequality and the sexist attitudes that persist from that. And by understanding this, we understand that the family as we know it today has not eternally existed in this form. It will not continually exist in form. And consequently, the role of women in society will not continue to exist in this form forever. Emancipation can be won and it will be won and it will come through the destruction of private property and by the working class fighting together to build a socialist society.